and the Federal Reserve Board is disbanded and replaced with a monetary authority. So that's for the policy part of the monetary policy, and then the Federal Reserve Banks, or the National Central Bank, that would enact, that would put into effect the policy. So you've got a separation of policy and administration there. And then stop banks creating money, and we, we do that simply by making money a custodial asset of the holder, the account holder. So that means that it's an asset of the holder and a liability to nobody else. And that's the same way that things that are, you know, like a safety deposit box, what you put in a safety deposit box, that's your asset and the bank's just looking after it for you. And the same thing with securities, you know, banks hold securities as custodial items for customers. And so does the Federal Reserve Bank, actually. It holds, you know, the, the treasuries for China and Vietnam and all those countries. Okay, so banks know how to do that because they're doing it already. And then we, when the economy needs more money, which we can get from various determinations, and it mainly be through indicating whether there's interest rates and borrowing and lending are going up or down, or whether inflation's going up or down, there'd be a lot of indicators, then, and plus measurements of what's happening in the economy. So the Monetary Authority will advise the Congress, we recommend that you issue this much more money over this much time, and it's up to you guys, you know, still the, Cong the Constitution says Congress has the purse strings, so they decide how to spend it. Now, the Need Act um, identifies areas where we strongly encourage Congress to spend it. Um, and if, you know, it's come up in questions before, what if the Congress is totally dysfunctional? Oh, do you know, do you know when that might be? Like, maybe now? Um, well, there's a thing called the Revolving Fund in the Need Act, which means that if the Congress is totally dysfunctional, there's, there's a fund of, of all the loan repayments coming from the banks which is available that the Treasury can reissue to, to maintain the money supply and so that um, they, we don't get a recession or de depression or deflation or whatever. And because it's a revolving fund, and the Treasury operates hundreds of revolving funds and so does the Department of Energy and Department of Agriculture, and they don't need congressional um, appropriations every year or whatever because they're like a, a continuous, they're like on a continuous resolution basis. So, um, so that means that there wouldn't be a big crash even if Congress was totally dysfunctional. Okay, so again, the first basic element, put Fed in the Treasury, and the US Mint that makes the coins, and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, which makes the currency, they're already in the Treasury, so just the, what's happening is that the electronic part of the money supply, which is most of it, goes in the Treasury as well, under the same roof. So you've got the three different bureaus under the same roof, rather than one being sort of an outlier. And uh, this is, is current law, that the Fed is already under the Secretary of the Treasury, if there's a dispute or whatever, the Secretary of the Treasury's word is, is the final word. So, it's again, it's, it's conserving what already exists in the legal structures. Okay. So, and the Fed Board is replaced with the Monetary Authority, like I said. Okay, so the Constitution, that says that we should have been having this all along, you know. And, you know, for a while we did with the US Mint, and that was what people thought of as money back then, was coins, you know, and, well, when the, when the Constitution was written, when the, when the US, United States first started, there were no banks, you know, so it was all coins to start with, and then banknotes appeared, and then later on bank ledger, you know, and checkbook checks and all that came about. Oh, and actually notice, notice that... Um, in that same um, clause of the Constitution, it also talks about weights and measures. And so the weights and measures is um, handled by an agency of the Department of Commerce. So there's no, you know, there's no, obviously the Treasury, that's to do with money, so that would be the um, government agency that deals with that, or the Department of Government. And so it's not, there's no... Uh, there's nothing strange about a department of the federal government administering these functions. You know, um, some people say, oh, well, it should be a body of Congress, you know, like the Congressional Budget Office or the Congressional Research Service, but really that would be a, that would be a difference from what, what the other parts of that clause in the Constitution say, 
where it's a department of the federal government that handles the weights and measures. So, you know, equally it should be a department of the federal government that handles the, the money. To be consistent. Okay, so the Treasury knows that they have this power. They say it in the US Mint annual report, seniorage, you know, that's the profit from creating money, arises when the federal government exercises its sovereign power to create money. So they know that they can do it, and they do do it when they issue coins, but that's like 0.4% of the money supply, so they're not really doing much of it. And here again, from another annual report, seniorage adds to the government's cash balance. Uh, John Howell talked about his um, banker friends that talk about their reserves as being cash, and that's because you know any, any sort of commercial organisation is th what they have in liquid um, money assets, monetary assets, it's just, they just call it cash. It's just like a, a category on the balance sheet. And so it includes banks' um, reserves at the Federal Reserve. It includes the, um, cat, the actual physical money that, and currency and coin that the banks hold in their vaults. And it also includes um, banks' bank accounts with other banks which they do hold, you know. So that all comes under, it's all lumped under the one term cash. And the same with government, you know, they, they've got a balance sheet and they call whatever money they've got, they call that cash as well. It's just a phrase, it's just a category on a, an accounting balance sheet. Okay, now, now we're talking about accounting. These are the top accountants in the country. And, you know, that means there should really be the, among the top accountants in the world. And so what do they say about money and seniorage and all this? Well, that's a bit small, but I can, you'll have to trust me that I have not changed the words here. I've just made them a bit bigger. And so seniorage results from the sovereign power of the government to directly create money and although not an inflow of resources from the public, which means it's not taking anything that already exists from anybody else, it does increase the government's net position in the same manner as an inflow of resources. So net position, that means net assets, and another word for net assets is equity. Okay, because equity is what's left over after liabilities are deducted from assets. So what that means is that money is created as equity, not debt. And that's what happens when coins are issued. And the seniorage adds to the Treasury's cash balance. So this is what it looks like on a balance sheet when the Fed buys coins from the Treasury. See, it's increased the assets and it has not increased the liabilities. There's no debt involved, no debt at all. So when you hear economists say all money is debt, well, not the coins issued by the US Mint, which is you know part of what's called lawful money. Bob Petit had a part of the Federal Reserve Act which talked about lawful money. Well, US coins are lawful money, and they are not debt. Now this is something that economists that fancy themselves as accountants, they just cannot get into their heads, it seems. But there it is, it's pretty simple. And the balance sheet still balances. Now on the Federal Reserve's um, flow of funds accounts, this seniorage, because it's, not, because it's an asset that's not balanced by a liability, a financial liability, they call this seniorage a discrepancy. Well, it's a good discrepancy to have because if you had the whole money supply as that discrepancy, that means that you'd be able to have a money supply that didn't keep disappearing all the time and having to be reborrowed and rented from the banks all the time, which is the sort of money that we should have. It's the sort of money that we had originally when the Mint was set up. And um, with the Need Act, it's the sort of money we get. And so, Dr. Michael Kumhoff and Jeremy Abenez at the IMF, they, um, like, like Stephen said, Dr. Kumhoff came here for quite a few um, conferences. I think it was at least, well, at least three, maybe four conferences, and he sort of absorbed everything. And then um, 
he wrote his fantastic paper, The Chicago Plan Revisited, and he really, I love this quote, you know, money is therefore properly treated as government equity rather than government debt, which is exactly how Treasury coin is currently treated under US accounting conventions, which is that Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board um, handbook that I showed you. And here, now I love this phrase, government issued money which represents equity in the Commonwealth rather than debt is the central liquid asset of the economy. Equity in the Commonwealth. So basically money is like a share. We all, it's like a, everybody has a share in the production of the country, you know, or a right. It's a, like Joseph Huber in his upcoming book says, it's a drawing right on the ability of the society and the economy to produce goods and services as when and required, as when and where required. So what does it mean for the economy? You know, the economists have been mistrained that they, they think that if the government created money, that would just cause inflation because there's been so much propaganda about the YMR inflation and all that, which Stephen covers in his book, and it was nothing to do with the government creating money at all. But everybody thinks that somehow. Maybe it's this hypnotic writing I was talking about. I don't know. But um, no, Dr. Kumhoff, he ran it through his model. He had calibrated it with the US economy. He compared it to the current situation, and he found that it creates zero inflation in a steady state when you match the economy with the growth of output in the economy, when you match the money supply with the growth of output in the economy. So, you know, that kills that inflation bogey right there. So any, if an economist says, oh, that would create inflation, just cite Dr. Kumhoff's paper at the IMF, say no, no. And then Dr. Kumhoff gives all the mathematics that all of the uh, economists and central bankers use. So if they want to argue, they'll have to argue with all of that, you know. So again, three key words to understand the Need Act, equity, and now this word, bailment. Now I hadn't actually heard of this word bailment, but basically this is what legally money becomes under the Need Act. And what it means is that it's property that is owned by somebody but they put it into safekeeping with somebody else. So, you know the self-storage places where you can store your furniture if you're moving house or whatever. So, when you do that, that's called bailed property. So, the property, is, the, the furniture is still yours, you're still the owner of the furniture, but the self-storage place is looking after it for you. So, that's what that means. And that's what under the Need Act, banks would do with your money accounts, with your deposits. They'll be looking after it for you, which, after all, from the age of about five or six, isn't that what we're taught that banks do? Yeah. So, with the Need Act, they'll actually do what we've been taught all this time. Now, the other word here is fiduciary, and we have to thank Bob Petit for coming up with this word when we were working out how do we explain what we're trying to do in accounting language and all that. And so fiduciary just basically means that someone is acting for you as your agent on your behalf and in your best interest. And so banks will also do that, particularly when they're taking in savings or investment funds from you and investing them or lending them out for you. They'll have a fiduciary relationship with you. You know, they're acting as your agent, basically, as your, as, as your sort of intermediary. Okay, well, we probably don't have time to go through this in detail, but I'll, you know, we'll send these, um, we can, we'll make this presentation available so you can look at what equity, well, you know what equity means, but it's got some nice um, corollary um, meanings in legal and social, um, in the legal and social realms as well. And then bailment, well, I'll basically un I'll explain that. Fiduciary, I'll basically explain that. So, yeah, equity is what remains after liabilities are deduct deducted from assets. Bailment is entrusting your property for safekeeping by another. And fiduciary is entrusting someone to act on your good and benefit, for your good and benefit. Okay, so the Need Act makes money equity owned by the holders and entrusted to banks as bailment and banks act as a fiduciary capacity for their customers. So, and so just, um, you know, so you know when you're looking through the Need Act, which is, um, 
it's in the 32 page brochure which is available at the back of the room there and it's all um, only on 12 pages you know fancy a, a, such an amazing groundbreaking piece of legislation that can fit on 12 pages of, a, of um, letter size so money for the first time really as far as I'm aware is actually defined in law because when you know when the, de the definition of money is the key thing you know if you define money as something else then it's you're never going to figure out, you're never going to have a money system. So money is the legal expression of sovereign power that confers upon its bearer an unconditional means of payment. You know, there are lots of other types of means of payment. You know, you can say, oh, I'll, um, I'll mow your lawn if you wash my dishes or whatever. You know, that's payment in kind. And there might be, um, oh, I'll, um, I'll do this work for you and I'll, we'll write this contract and then you pay me back later. And that's a a credit debt or contractual relationship, but that's not paying money, that's, that's paying money later, you know. So money is defined in law and deposit, the meaning of deposit is basically the threshold is whatever's covered by the FDIC and the National Credit Union Administration in law, that's what is money, that's what we use for money in accounts that transfer from one person to another. And anything else, all these other sorts of instruments, these exotic instruments, we don't use those. You don't. You don't go down to the Seven Eleven to buy a, a nice organic orange juice, and you don't go and give them a, a credit. What a credit default swap! You don't go and give them one of those, do you? You don't go and give them a collateralized debt obligation. You don't go and give them a repurchase agreement. No, no, you don't. You give them a dollar or a two dollars or whatever it costs. Okay. So economists sort of tr sometimes try to say that all of this other stuff is money as well, but really it's not because you're not using it in the real economy. Maybe maybe financial firms they shift these um, ownership of these things around a bit, but that's that's an internal deal among themselves. It's not it's not um, in the general economy. It's not it's not buying anything that you know people use like goods and services or assets that are real like um, houses and things like that. And so it's all coordinated with other law as well. Okay, well, I'll have to skip through a lot of this, but this just goes through. The governing principle of the monetary authority is to not to cause inflation or deflation and to be consistent with the um, sustainable long-run growth potential of the economy. Um, we've gone through a lot of this. Okay, so stop banks creating money. I'll show you how it's done graphically in a little bit. Okay, here we go. So at the moment, um, what we call um, bank money or deposits, they're a liability of the bank. So we take that out, put it down there as a memorandum item, which means it's a custodial item, and we replace, we replace that debt that they had to their customers, which is sort of a bit of a phony debt. But now that this money is actually permanent, it's not sort of temporary money, it means that when it's repaid to the banks, it's, it's, if, the, if we didn't um, replace that obligation to the customers with another obligation, the banks would end up with all the money when it's once all the previous loans are repaid. So um, instead, we, they pass through that money back to the Treasury and the revolving fund administered by the Federal Reserve Banks under the Monetary Authority and then that money is then recycled back into the economy so we don't get a shrinkage of the money supply when bank loans are repaid. Like we can do at times at present, like John Howell said in his talk, um, if the amount of loans being made by the banks is not keeping up with the rate of loan repayments then we get a shrinking money supply and that's what happened you know, after the 2008 crash the money supply was actually decreasing and it was only the, um, the actions of the Fed with their QE and all that which sort of propped up the, the money supply figures even though they did fall still in, in total amount they would have fallen a lot more if it hadn't been for that QE but of course all that QE went to the financial sector went to prop up the price of stocks and bonds and things like that when it's still doing it basically because they're still churning it around and um, it didn't really go into the real economy much Okay, so depository entries become fiduciaries, and they, they already do this, you know, they're already fiduciaries. They don't, they've got all the rules, this is from the um, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, you know, all the bank regulators, they, they, know, they know how to deal with fiduciary activities and 
and all that. There's the FDIC, safekeeping, custody accounts, you know, all this is already known. So it's not like anything new has to be invented at all. Okay, so payments um, after the Need Act is converted, when money is converted into money, but in the, in the same bank it's the same as now, it just transfers from one account to another, and between banks we don't have this um, sort of two-tier system of two circuits of tra uh, transfer of deposits and a transfer of reserves, because the money is the money, it doesn't need reserves to settle, the payment of money is the settlement of that transaction, so it's direct, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer payment system with no need for netting or clearing or settling later. So it's direct, it's immediate. So it actually makes it much more efficient. The payment system becomes much more efficient. Banks' um, operations become much more efficient because they don't have to do everything twice, they only have to do it once. Okay. All right, well, we've been through that. So, yeah, so the, as banks' um, uh, loans are repaid, the principal is passed through to the revolving fund and the banks keep their interest as their income like they do now because you know they have to pay their staff, they have to pay their bills and all that. So um, they, don't, they don't lose out from it. And so if the banks ever need, uh, so, so how will banks make loans in the future and after the Need Act? Well, they'd, they'd borrow the funds from savers and investors, the same as finance companies have to, the same as real estate investment trusts have to, the same as insurance companies do, the same as all of these other financial institutions that aren't banks have to do. So it puts banks on a level playing field with all the other financial institutions. So they should be you know, lobbyists for the Need Act as well. And then yeah, that money, those repayments are passed through the revolving fund. And so if, the, if, there ever, if the banks can't raise enough funds from attracting bar, um, savers and investors, they can borrow from the revolving fund. The, the same way they borrow from the Fed now. You know, they put up some of their um, securities or whatever, as, and they, um, they can borrow funds, and then when they get repaid, they'll repay the funds back into the revolving fund, and then it can be recycled, you know, continuously. Okay, so I think we've already been through that. Oh, okay, so, so new loans would just appear on the balance sheet of the bank as um, being borrowed from a customer and being loaned to another customer. So that's the new loans part, and sort of in the middle there. So that would be the only um, funds that they'd have at risk. But the rest of the money supply, the rest of the everything that's in your checking account, that wouldn't be at risk with the Need Act, whereas currently it is. You may not realise it, but at the moment your bank deposits are treated as your unsecured loan to your bank, which is uh, maybe not a sobering thought. Uh, I hope I don't keep you up tonight. Okay, so where would banks get money to, to make loans? You know, people say, oh, but if you did that, the banks wouldn't be able to make loans. Well, yes, they would. They'd actually be able to make more loans. Um, they'd, they've, there's a whole lot of savings accounts and all that. At the moment, savings accounts and time deposits, that's just dead money. That's money that's basically taken out of circulation. So that actually, you know, people that have got those accounts would be able to direct the bank, okay, I want to invest this much in this thing, this much in this thing, and the banks would actually lend that money. It would actually become reactivated back into the economy. Then there's the redeeming treasuries. Where's, what's going to happen when those are redeemed? If people have got money, they want to invest in something, they want to, they're going to have to invest in corporate bonds or something like that, or they'll, they'll invest in bank bonds and you know, the banks will then pass on the, the money, to, they'll lend it to businesses and that, and the banks are good at assessing risk, you know, they call that underwriting. Well, they used to do that, I mean, and they should do it again. And then banks own funds. You know, banks will keep their reserves under the Need Act, but they won't need them to be settling um, between the banks. So they'll have those funds to be able to use for making loans as well, because the reserves become money the same as deposits. They basically all become deposits. And the reserves are just the bank's deposits at the Fed, which is what they are now. But they'll actually be able to be released into the economy. You know, there's a big um, misunderstanding that President Obama thought that if... Um, this quantitative easing worked, you know, the, creating all these extra reserves that the banks would be able to lend those into the economy, but they can't because the reserves only exist on the bank on the computer system at the central bank, at the Federal Reserve Banks. They don't, they cannot enter our bank accounts. The two separate types of money on two separate circuits, 
And Joseph Huber explains this brilliantly in his new book, Upcoming, and, um, and he's going to be here on, um, he's going to be presenting on Saturday, so he's, he's going to be covering all that in um, quite some detail, and, and if he doesn't, you can ask him and he can explain it with crystal clear clarity, like, um, well, yeah, like John Howell did. But, um, okay, and then, uh, like I said before, the banks can borrow from the revolving fund. And if all that fails after how many trillion dollars, then the Congress can enact some more senior origination, which could be, you know, entered into the economy, and they, then that money becomes available for um, whoever accumulates it. It can be invested as well. So, you know, there's no shortage of money for lending from banks. Okay, and then the third element is to um, add money for the general welfare, which is what the Constitution says that the federal government is supposed to be doing, you know, promoting the general welfare. And, you know, they do it to a certain extent, but, I mean, really, if they, if they were able to issue the money, they'd be able to do a lot more for the general welfare, you know, education, infrastructure, health care, all sorts of things like that, which, um, as Nick Egnott showed in his... Um, his thing that the US is like third worst in the world for some things, you know, and so really with all of the natural resources and human resources of the US, it really should be at the top. And there's more stuff that the Title V does. 25% um, 20, uh, of the money goes is distributed to the states directly as grants, and there's also interest-free lending for local government and state government, actually. So they don't need to issue bonds anymore and then pay interest on their bills and then have to tax their citizens at state and local level. They basically have a revolving... From the revolving fund, they have interest-free loan facility so they can use it on, on an ongoing basis without having an interest bill. So they can, you know, maybe ease the taxes on their citizens and ratepayers and, you know, school districts and all that, property taxes and all that, which are horrendous going in Chicago at the moment. And there's an initial dividend to everybody. It's basically, a, it's the payback for the Federal Reserve, which is basically means the people, as Bob Petit said, all of this is an obligation of the United States. It's basically payback for all of the backstopping and under, and um, safety net that the Federal Reserve system has provided for the banks. And so they've accumulated all these assets on their balance sheet, which they don't need to hold anymore because Reserves are not treated as liabilities, they're just a custodial item. So all of those assets can be sold back into the market and the funds can be used to distribute a, a dividend to everybody. So it's basically payback time. And I'll go into that in more detail in my talk on Saturday. And so things like Social Security can be assured, you know, that the government can no longer say, oh, we've got no money, we've got no money, and oh, we're going to have to cut your pensions and all that. No, they won't be able to say that. Okay, and it can fund universal health care, it can resolve the mortgages, underwater mortgages, there's ways to do that. It enhances the FDIC to make sure that things are secure. And it reduces the um, maximum interest rates, which is only back in the 19, well, about 1980s, those anti-usury laws were sort of repealed, but that, the average was about 8% was the maximum interest rate you could charge. So, and historically, interest rates have been let below that most of the time, so it's not like it's um, anything onerous. Okay, so in summary, puts the money system in the hands of the people through their government, through their elected representatives, makes monetary policy truly accountable because all of these um, decisions and statistics and all that, and there's this provision in the Need Act that they all have to be reported to the media and the people, you know, they have to have press conferences and all that, like the Fed does now, but they do it sort of after, well after the event, and they only go to Congress twice a year. Um, it conserves the existing money supply, it safeguards the payment system, so there's no more too big to fail or too big to jail, you know, banks would be able to fail, those money accounts just transfer to another bank that you nominate where you want your money to be transferred to because they're not dependent on the, the solvency of the bank. You know, it's being held in custody. It's not, it doesn't matter whether the bank makes bad investment decisions or whatever. That's for your, for your um, checking account deposits anyway. And your savings accounts or investment accounts, well, I mean, if you're investing, you should be aware that there's some risks. But... Um, one of the things we want to add for the new um, Need Act is to have a 
basically a risk-free um, small savings account um, account type of system where basically if they just invested in US, um, US savings bonds, which are basically risk-free and they're non-transferable, there's no games get played with those and there's other, other federal government um, things that are guaranteed by the government and that could, could provide a small return for small savers, you know, um, basically risk-free and the FDIC wouldn't be um, under any risk there. And it adds new money for public purposes. No inflation or deflation, no more boom and bust, no more recessions, depressions. You know, this is, I think someone was asking how much, how many recessions have we had? Well, it's 47 in that, in that period, which works out, I think I worked it out one time, as an average of one every five years or one every seven years, something like that. And I actually did the exercise of how many, um, there's been since the Fed was set up, because one of the big rationales of the Fed being set up in 1913 was that it would stop all these panics and all that. But actually the average number of recessions and depressions after the Fed, I think the average was 7.2, and before the Fed the average was 7.1 years. So it really <laughs> hasn't done anything, you know. Hasn't done anything to improve it, because the banking system is, the, is in the driving seat. They're driving... The, um, the booms and busts, the, the Federal Reserve is just there to clean up the mess, basically. So wh what the NEED Act does, it ends unemployment crisis because it creates lots of new jobs, ends the debt crisis, you know, the national debt just can just be paid off as it comes due, it ends the fiscal crisis at the federal, state and local level, it means they can, you know, the budgets won't be in the red because of all the granting and, and um, interest-free lending. It ends the financial crisis because the economy becomes much more stable because, as it says in Michael Kumhoff's um, paper at the, from the Bank of England, uh, banks are not intermediaries and, and why this matters. He, he ran that through his model again and he showed that the system where banks lend, um, save as money, is much more stable than the current system where banks create deposits when they make loans and it actually increases the um, efficiency of the economy as well. And the US dollar becomes a stable currency because it's not, you know, not always being inflated or deflated all the time, and so it becomes, it'll become a popular asset. I mean, it already is a popular asset, but it'll, it'll maintain its popular asset for people overseas as well. So what you can do with this, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with this to be a sustainable world, you know, we, we, need, we need this future to happen and it really can't happen under the current money system. It can only happen when we have a proper sovereign monetary system where money is a, a share, a right, and it's distributed to do the things that we need to do rather than having to be continuously borrowed and repaid and borrowed and repaid. And you're, never, you're always behind the eight ball if that happens when, when you're in a situation like that. You can, never, you can never get ahead, but we need to get ahead. We need to get ahead very quickly. Thank you.